Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to Lohang and Julia. My name is Il Chang Yi. I'm Senior Research Coordinator at United Nations Research Institute for Social Development or UNRWA. I'm in charge of the Alternative Economies for Transformation program. Uh, for Julia Lohang, if you do not know much about UNRWA, I will briefly explain about UNRWA and its research activities on the social and solidarity economy. UNRWA was established in 1963 as an autonomous research institute within the UN system. The mandate of UNRWA is uh, doing policy relevant cutting edge research on social development that is pertinent to the work of the United Nations Secretariat, regional commissions and uh, specialized agencies like IRO, WHO and national institutions. Ernest has a long history of research on uh, social and solidarity economy. Uh, actually, one of the first researches we did was the research project of the 1960s, which was entitled Rural Cooperatives, uh, Rural Institutions uh, as Agents of Plan Changes. Uh, since then, Ernest has continued its research on the core values and principles of SSE, such as genuine participation, democracy within and beyond the organization and redistribution. Since 2010, UNRWA has been designing and implementing various research projects, uh, especially uh, focusing on social and solidarity economy, or SSE. And since 2015, the research has been focusing on how SSE contributes to um, achieving the SDGs and how to develop the enabling environment or policy ecosystem to promote SSE as a means of implementation of the SDGs. One of these researches is the guidelines for local governments on policies for social and solidarity economy, which has been uh, conducted in collaboration with GSEP. I'm very much proud to say um, that we have presenters of three case studies, which provided a basis of these guidelines. They are Liverpool, Montreal, and Seoul. We are with Alan Seden, PI of the Hazard Time Institute at the University of Liverpool, the UK. Margie Mendel, Professor Emerita, Concordia University and Nancy Nimtan, former CEO of the Chantier de l'Economie Sociale. And finally, Sanyun Lee, professor of Songgong Hae University. At the end, I will talk about the guidelines itself briefly. Before we move on to the presentations, I'd like to make a couple of housekeeping announcements. Firstly, this session is going to be recorded and uh, published online later. Uh, if you have any issues concerning recording and publication of this session video, please let us know uh, during the session. Secondly, this session is supposed to be finished at 1 p.m., but we have a delay and we may have to we may have to move on to another session. So we have to finish this session around 12:50. And around 12.50, we may have to cry out like, a, you know, beat me up, Scotty, <laughs> like in Spaceship Enterprise. Okay, then we will go for the first presenter, Alan. Thank you. So uh, I'm Alan Southern. I'm from the University of Liverpool, the Hesseltine Institute. And the work that we did was with my colleagues, Helen Heap and Matt Thompson. And the three of us have been involved in supporting the social and solidarity economy in the Liverpool city region over the last few years. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about some of the things that we've done and also how public policy has enabled the social and solidarity economy. On the one hand, it uh, has been a limiting factor, but it's also it's, uh, it, it, there's been some facilitation as well. So we'll go to the next slide, please. And there's three questions we're going to try to address uh, in the next 10 minutes. Um, it's the type and pub the sorts of public policies that can enable the social and solidarity economy in the UK. Um, 
how public policy has shaped the social and solidarity economy in the Liverpool city region. What does it look like? And how can we use public sector policies and plans to enable further development of the social economy in a city region like Liverpool? These, these are, this is this third question is something that we're facing now. Thanks, John. Next, next one. Well, in the eyes of Kingdom, there isn't a, a national framework or legal form for the social and solidarity economy. There's no legal definition of social enterprise, for example. And the policy framework really in the United Kingdom is falls under general business legislation and that's company law rather than uh, public policy. And company law is mainly designed to support larger organisations. So many, many small businesses are subject to company law and so too social enterprises, uh, cooperatives, worker cooperatives, community cooperatives and so on. So the social and solidarity economy is broadly regulated uh, by company law. However, uh, in the UK over the last 30 years plus, there's been an ethos of deregulation and that's really uh, 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 had a momentum in the 21st century. And again, that's mainly aimed at the for-profit sector, but this process of deregulation has affected uh, the social economy as well. Uh, I'm going to mention how. Next, please. So from the 1990s under the last Labour administration, there was a real focus on market ideals for social enterprise. And this is when social enterprise in the United Kingdom starts to uh, become, become the normal term that we'd use for previously uh, a, a trading charity or a, a workers cooperative or a community uh, type of enterprise. We, we started to use this all encompassing term of social enterprise. And the interesting thing at that point in time was was the new Labour's uh, ideals around the third way uh, encourage social enterprise at the same time as enabling new forms of privatisation. So this was a Labour government that was carrying on the privatisation process and policies of previous Conservative governments. And what they sought to do is rather than get for profits involved in privatisation, they thought, well, we could have social enterprise involved. Uh, there was a real uh, stimulus to social enterprise at that particular time. Interestingly enough that there was much less attention to the operation of social economy organisations in markets other than those markets which were previously nationalised. So particularly in health, for example, and particularly in things like social care, uh, we see the emergence of social enterprises picking up uh, the services that the state had previously previously run. Overall, little concern with solidarity and democratic ownership. And the focus was on uh, enabling a third way, the third sector organisations of the social economy, social enterprises specifically, to pick up some of the privatisations. Next, please. Nevertheless, uh, there were a number of, over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a, a number of pieces of policy at a national level that have stimulated the social economy and the formation of community interest companies, for example, that's a legal definition, not social enterprise, but what we refer to as KIC community interest company. And what that did was it enabled an asset lock-in for community-based initiatives for social enterprises. So that uh, that asset that was owned by the community couldn't be uh, sold off by anyone behaving in unscrupulous ways. Uh, Cooperative legislation was 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 renewed, and a, a new form of cooperative was uh, introduced, known as uh, a BenCom benefit uh, of community benefit, BenCom benefit for the community, and these were basically to stimulate uh, community-based cooperatives uh, alongside what we traditionally would know as worker cooperatives. One of the interesting things about community cooperatives is the ability to raise what's known as community shares. I might buy a share for £100, you might buy a share for £10, we both have one voting right. Uh, and charities, there was, there was changes to the charity law, uh, which was aimed to reduce uh, bureaucratic administration. Charities have to register through the Charity Commission, 
and uh, through uh, uh, what's known as company's house as a, as a business. And the aim was to reduce some of the administrative burden facing the charity. Another significant piece of legislation was what's known as the Public Services Act in 2012, the Social Value Act in short, we call it. And this aimed to stimulate social value in public procurement. Pretty limited uh, experience. Uh, we find it very, very complex. Many, many uh, smaller businesses and social economy organizations struggle to uh, navigate the complexity. And it's been left for larger organizations really to uh, articulate their social value uh, and, uh, and to hoover up uh, many, many public sector procurements. A third uh, very significant piece of legislation was devolution that occurred in the United Kingdom and the most significant being uh, devolved parliaments of some sort for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland and in England uh, as part of that de devolution uh, deal came city region governance and for Liverpool city region in 2016 it became an administrative, uh, administrative unit. Next slide please. And this is the Liverpool City region. Uh, and to add to the complexity, you can see the six districts, each with their own local government. And uh, on, alongside that, not on top, it's not a hierarchy, but alongside that is the city region made up of those six uh, administrative uh, districts. And the city region has its own administration and it has its own city region mayor. And in Liverpool, we've got a population of about 1.6 million across these six districts. Liverpool is obviously the biggest uh, it's a city region with a strong maritime history that has suffered economically since the 1970s. Next slide, please. The history of the social and solidarity economy in Liverpool is really rooted in philanthropy and charitable trust, also the syndicalism of the trade union. So that maritime industry brought us wealth, um, you know, as the city became important in the slave trade, and that wealth uh, led to philanthropy and charitable trust. It also led to a very strong syndicalist character of the trade union movement and many, many communities uh, of uh, black and ethnic minority uh, origin that had come through the port. Latter part of the 20th century, we see struggles around community development, development and housing cooperatives in Liverpool city region are different from the rest of the country uh, with a strong housing cooperative flavour. Uh, the city region qualifies for special European funding, Objective 1 funding, the first part of the United Kingdom because of, the, of its poverty. And at the same time, in the 1990s, uh, it, it, it helps to stimulate that social enterprise sector. Post-2010, we have uh, austerity and the response from the social and solidarity economy is, uh, is kind of, it's quick to realise uh, the real dangers for communities uh, facing uh, uh, some, some of that austerity and stimulating some radical politics as well. Next slide, please. So when we did our initial research and we began to engage those organisations in the social economy, we, we found that there was about 1,400 trade and social and solidarity economy organisations in the city region. We, we estimate, we've done a little bit of updating of that, and we estimate about 2,000 now. And we, we found that it was a significant sector, one that was comparable with other sectors that were receiving much more attention in the way of local policy. We also made the point that the persistent poverty in the city region and the kind of effects of austerity had led to a very determined response from those organisations. And we see uh, them active in education, housing, health and social work, social care, uh, arts, entertainment and recreation. All those where you, you probably find social organisations active. Next slide, please. Uh, what we also found was the concentration of these organisations, those that trade, these social organisations in the social and solidarity economy, and they were located there in the poorest of areas across the city region. So this map shows the black dots where the social organisations are concentrated and the red are the poorest parts of the city region and the green are the most affluent, where it's dark green, for example, on the west, 
This is where, you know, we have footballers living, billionaires, and up to the north as well. Uh, where again, we have that kind of uh, uh, affluence. Uh, nevertheless, we see uh, that that you know there's a correlation of some sort here, and we need to ask why. We know it's about market failure in these communities. We know it's about the retreat of the state as austerity hit and privatisation. There's a historic positioning of some of these organisations around housing too. Next slide, please. So the question is, how can we use public policy to enable the social and solidarity economy? And we've got to use, obviously, uh, national policy where we can. We need to exploit the devolution of governance um, and, you know, to work with our city region mayor and his administration in that way. We need to, to gently persuade them that policy needs to meet the needs of those organizations in the social economy and not necessarily the needs of the providers build on the history and the content and the dynamic shape the economy and make it more social in general but the way to do that we believe is to build a strong narrative about what the social and solidarity economy can offer to for the people of liverpool city region next slide please we need to use national legislation to shape markets. One way is to really try and exploit the Social Value Act uh, to stimulate aggregate demand locally uh, and to uh, enable the access of those social organisations and small businesses to pick up on public sector procurement. This is extremely difficult and the levels of expertise needed, it's very, very technical expertise and it doesn't exist really, except in very, very rare uh, instances. We also need to think about um, how we can expand employment rights and move into the private sector. And the other area is uh, often from national government. Uh, we have a government now that talks about levelling up. There'll be particular regener regeneration initiatives. And we know that some types of social and solidarity economy organisation will be able to access funding better. For example, around high street renewal, particularly after the pandemic, uh, community business asset transfer, particularly around properties and community cooperatives. Next slide, please. So one of the things we've tried to do, and we've achieved this in the last two to three years, and I have to say, uh, you know, our, our kind of work looking at, um, at, at Montreal and Quebec has informed us. Um, we've been able to kind of convince uh, policy makers that uh, we need uh, a voice in the combined authority the liverpool city region combined authority and the liverpool city region social and solidarity panel uh, social and solidarity economy panel is that voice where we've got uh, 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 practitioners working alongside policy officers uh, in thinking about how we kind of plan strategically for the social economy our industrial strategy for the region, the plan for prosperity, has a narrative that's built around the arguments we've made for the social economy, around inclusion and fairness. But this is limited. Where it talks about achieving carbon zero or technological innovation, we see that the social economy isn't there. Yeah. We've one of the the uh, the best things we've done is we've uh, launched a new social investment vehicle. This is a standalone social enterprise, a community investment company that's raised six million pound, five million pound from the combined authority and one million pound from elsewhere. And this is a social investment vehicle for those social enterprises. And uh, we've distributed about a million pound of that funding already for to support the growth of existing uh, socially trading organisations in the social economy. And the Liverpool City Region Land Commission is one of the first of its kind also. Uh, uh, it's built ideas about asset transfer and social value. And our representatives from the social economy on that land commission have pushed hard for uh, community involvement in the decision making that will uh, emanate from, from that process. Next slide, please. There's still more to do. Uh, the social and solidarity economy in the city region needs greater levels of organisation. It needs stronger support agencies that can provide advice. Those who know about the social economy and don't simply know about business. It needs great, greater levels of democracy and accountability within the, within the sector itself. If they're speaking on behalf of the whole sector, it has to represent the sector. And we need greater levels of diversity. We have some fantastic uh, uh, social organisations in our BAME communities, 
often they're not visible. And also we need to train the leaders of tomorrow in the, this sector. Next slide, please. We need better forms of finance and social investment. Our, our uh, social vehicle, social investment vehicle, Kindred, is just one of many that we really need. We need to be able to target types and sizes of organisation for growth, to encourage new startup in, in these sectors, provide better levels of education as well for the managers and workforce in the sector. And we can only do that really by working with those public authorities and building policy on a, a cooperative basis to raise the awareness of the sector. Next slide, please. And just come to some concluding thoughts. In the UK, we have a Conservative national government and we've got a, a, a local Labour government. The Metro Mayor is Labour, uh, the six districts are all Labour. So that means it's not always a cohesive relationship and there's problems around it. And this was sharpened uh, during the pandemic, really. Uh, there's an obvious weakness in devolved governance around executive authority. In the UK, Parliament is sovereign. It remains so. It always has been, even uh, despite the rhetoric about, about the European Union in recent years. And the UK has really experienced many years now of the state being uh, constrained and restricted, hollowed out from national privatisations and uh, particularly a reduction in the income base for local authorities, for local governments. So there's much less resource to deploy and a greater emphasis on enabling markets. And this is the type of thing we've had to conclude with. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the, the social and solidarity economy in the Liverpool city region has made great strides, but it remains undercapitalized and understaffed. It's made up of mainly smaller organizations. They fill the gaps where once public services existed. The potential for the social and solidarity economy to move into private markets and address global challenges is still there and it needs to be encouraged. You know, we're facing challenges such as climate destruction, inequality and public health, and those organisations in the social and solidarity economy are primed to face those but lack resources. So it's, a, it's an enormous challenge that we see. Thank you, Elton. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. And um, Alan emphasised one of the elements of the ecosystem to promote SSE. Uh, that is uh, supporting agencies, intermediaries. And uh, after the death of Mayor Park in Seoul, everything was changed and there, was a, there has been a backlash to criticize all those SSE organizations, including supporting agencies. What's going on in Seoul? Let's go for the second presentation, Professor Sang Yun Lee, uh, about Seoul's SSE uh, policy. All right, thank you so much for inviting me to present the Seoul case. Uh, I really appreciate Il Chang Lee. Thank you. And uh, I want to say, uh, I think uh, you should stop your sharing screen, I think, Il Chang. Okay, I did it. Okay, great. Uh, uh, can you see it? Not yet. Oh, not yet. All right. Oh, okay. I can see that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, I'm not so sure you can see the full screen or not. Um, it works or not? I don't know. Let me check. Oops. It worked and it disappeared. Disappeared. Okay. Uh, let me try again. uh now it works or not i can see that you can right yes yes all right wonderful okay um okay uh let me uh present about seoul case i'm sang yun lee who is professor at Sungong university in seoul south korea well, this is Han River, actually, as you know, I mean, the miracle of Han River is the symbol of a South Korean economic development, right? This season is really best season to, I mean, visit and travel in South Korea. So if you have a chance to visit South Korea, I, I really recommend this season. 
this is the order of my presentation. I briefly look at the situation of South Korea and then um, we'll more focusing on the source case. And finally, uh, I will conclude uh, the, the, the case. All right. Uh, well, as you can see, South Korea is located between China and Japan. So historically, we do have a lot of a lot of complex among three countries. Uh, we do have uh, 50 million population, as you can see here. And in terms of trading volume, I'm number five in the world. That means heavily on. The, the international trading, actually, our economy is too much to rely on this trading. Uh, as you can see here, United States and Vietnam and other China uh, are the major trading partners and Japan as well. And semiconductor is the number one in terms of exporting items, uh, which is occupied by Samsung and SK, which are jabbers in South Korea. In terms of GDP, well, we, we are almost hit like a, a 1,600 billion, I think. I'm not so sure this is right uh, uh, terminology or not, but in terms of GDP, in terms of GNI, in terms of export, the Korean economy has grown rapidly, as you can see here, rest for decades. This, I think, leads a lot of inequality uh, gap uh, and a lot of social problems, especially, you know, top per top ten percent uh, actually occupy whole uh, uh, half I and mean, fifty percent of wealth in South Korea. This leads inequality and lots of social problems, as you can see in the movie of a Squid Game. Um, uh, more importantly, Korean economy is morely, more and more relying on big jabbers. As you can see here, that is also one of the problems and why, why social economy phenomenon happened in South Korea. This uh, presentation is based on the project by uh, UN Ally SD, uh, read uh, by Il Chang Lee. So I'm really thankful about it. As you can see here, uh, we do have a vivid uh, the sector of a social economy in South Korea, as you can see here. Uh, we do have more than 25,000 uh, social enterprises exist, and it uh, employed uh, more than like 250,000 people. Um, but uh, government target for policy is the four types, as you can see here, cooperatives and social enterprises and community enterprises and self-reliance enterprises, which are based on the special legal base. Uh, we do have a special legal framework for, uh, I mean, certain cooperatives, including agricultural cooperatives, credit union since the um, 1960s. But uh, after 2020, which is the starting point of the framework act on cooperatives, actually boosting uh, the social enterprises. Now, uh, the framework act on social economies under review so far, five bills are submitted. So lawmakers are reviewing, but uh, I'm not so sure why this uh, bill is not passed yet. Probably the concept is still kind of a controversial in South Korea. We, we, we did have a war, as you know, right? So people are kind of trauma about social, you know? So that is one of the reasons. But anyway, the understanding of this con concept is not like uh, too much uh, attention or attracted to uh, by the people. But uh, the Ministry of uh, Labor uh, 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 supported uh, the social entrepreneurship program. This is the result. So, so far, uh, uh, more than 3,000 social enterprises just kind of developed or built or created. Uh, The social enterprise is not only included just uh, cooperatives uh, or you know social ventures, but included many 
different types of organizations, as you can see here. So if the first, which is the Framework Act on Social Economy is passed, uh, we uh, predict 13 organization types are included, as you can see here, uh, corporate, general cooperatives and, and consumer cooperatives, agricultural cooperatives, etc. Now we are moving to on how Seoul develops social economy. Uh, as you can see here, Seoul is in the middle of a Korean peninsula. peninsula. Uh, we do have, I think, um, almost 10 million people. So that means a lot of social problems. The poor are getting poor and the, uh, the rich are getting rich, especially in the area and the nowadays real estate prices go up rapidly so people are suffering from uh, living condition but anyway uh, uh there are maybe those are the reasons why social solidarity enterprises are uh, created right to solve uh, social problems in terms of housing housing problems and food problems uh, and education problems something like that so far more than 4000 coops are created in Seoul only uh, so uh, this phenomenon clearly showed that social economy is vivid in Seoul especially in South Korea this is not just you know it's just a one night kind of uh, things, uh, but uh, since uh, the former mayor Park uh, 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 occupied the the, uh, the the city of Seoul, uh, the team actually uh, introduces many many legal actions, as you can see here. So, among them, uh, I uh, really emphasize the 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 growth of uh, and the uh, the growth is started by the framework of all this on the social economy economy uh, uh, launched in 2014. This is not just by the government, local government driven, but uh, the partnership between public and private uh, area. Uh, so there exist uh, private uh, social and solidarity groups, and then they actively cooperated with uh, the the city of Seoul uh, since the mayor Park uh, uh, took over uh, uh, the office. Uh, fortunately, he passed away, and now new uh, mayor occupied the uh, office. But you know, he tried to move all kind of this kind of policies. So I'm not so sure this. Uh, uh, so those cases is, are continuing or not, but we will see, right? I think so, social economy center uh, play the key role to promote and educate and concert as, uh, as it is. Uh, so setting up this intermediary organization is important to spread and promote the concept of a social economy. In addition, there are major initiatives, including uh, um, developing human resource for social sector and financing and the, uh, reducing information asymmetry uh, in the social economy sector. Uh, those are three major initiatives in Seoul. As you can see here, uh, the city of Seoul uh, promote uh, to educate uh, people to set up or create social and solidarity enterprises, uh, starting by uh, introducing the educational program. So, so far, uh, 45 courses are created and more than 7,000 people are educated from this program. This is the website. So uh, if you visit the website of SA Academy, you can get all kinds of information about the social and solidarity economy, including educational program and you know, uh, consulting program and general information, etc. So this is the hub of the social economy in Seoul. We 
uh, my university also are one of the agencies to promote uh, the educational program for social economy for several five several for several years. I think almost eight years. So uh, we educate more than one thousand uh, people. Uh, so so far, I think more than one hundred cooperatives are created by our program. Financing is also important because you know new firms or new uh, enterprise are really suffering from the legitimacy to get the financial resources. So, uh, so City of Seoul actually set up the uh, you know social investment fund, and they uh, loan uh, to the social and solidarity enterprises. And so far, as you can see here, more than. I think more than 1,000 enterprises get the loan from this program. In addition, uh, public procurement by the uh, local government of Seoul is also uh, one of the reasons why this sector is vivid. Uh, as you can see here, after 2014, which is the year of the frame of, uh, of the social economy, uh since then as you can see here the public uh procurement the size is getting uh, increased the portal uh this is connected with the the, the information uh hub so if you visit the website of uh, se hub net uh, you can get almost all information about the social economy uh, this is really valuable, I think, resources for not only the Seoul citizen, but also the, uh, the, the people who are, are, I mean, looking for certain information national wide. So this is really valuable resources. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> this kind of information uh, resources are, you know, uh, preserved and continued and the people I can access to know about this sector. Uh, this is uh, uh, the plan for you know uh, the the next uh, I mean social economy uh, in Seoul, but uh, I think it just stopped uh, by new mayor. Uh, hopefully, uh, this project will continue, but uh, we will see uh, uh, what's going on in Seoul uh, area. As congru concluding remarks, I mean, uh, well, uh, local government support is important, but at the same time, I mean, uh, autonomy and independence and sustainability is also very important to social and solidarity enterprises. Uh, but starting point would be the legal and institutional framework by local or central government, especially in Asian countries. Uh, well, uh, our power distance is quite high, which means, you know, uh, the central role is uh, heavily uh, uh, played key role, which means uh, the rigor and institutional frame is quite important to do something, to start. Uh, this is probably different from Western society. Uh, that's the reason why Liverpool case is, you know, without any legal framework, you know, you know, uh, the citizens, you know, they can actively do by themselves. But in South Korean cases, we do have our uh, sector, I mean, which are developed by the independently, but uh, at the same time, the government level, uh, local and central government framework, uh, legal frame plays important role to, 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 to grow this sector. All right, I think uh, though we do have a lot of policies and legal framework, um, I would say independence and autonomy is also one of the key challenging issues to face or solve to by uh, social and solidarity on enterprises. Thank you. Thank you, Sangyun.
Thank you very much for a very much detailed explanation about policies in Seoul. And the third presentation is about Montreal and Maji and Nancy Nimtan are the presenters, but they cannot be with us because of the COVID-19 situation in Montreal. Instead, they sent us the video presentation. So here it is. Sangyun, could you stop your sharing? I stopped it already. Okay. Um... Can you see this? Hello, my name is Nancy Nimpen. I'm pleased to participate in MS's 18th International Conference. We no, no not yet. Um, I'm talking to you from Montreal. You cannot see this? No, no. not yet. Okay. Tap. Hello, my name is Nancy Meenhan. Can you see this? No, we can hear it, uh, obviously, because it's on your machine, but we, we're not able to see the screen. Okay. Cancel and I will try entire screen share and your entire screen. Okay. Not this one. But, uh, We practiced uh, with blue zines and <laughs> suddenly the platform was changed and uh, we have problem. Please to participate in MS. Why don't you use the, the the number three choice tab? Yeah, I tried it first of all. And okay, it didn't something's happening now. Something we can see. There we go. I think okay. we can see right now. Can okay, you, can you? Hear it? Yes. Okay, good. Here you go. Hello, my name is Nancy Meenhan. I'm pleased to participate in MS's 18th International Conference, Research Conference on Social Enterprise. Um, I'm talking to you from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Uh, I'm the former uh, CEO of the Chantilly Lake and Social. And the study we have done on public policy uh, to enable the social solidarity economy in the city of Montreal was done conjointly with Kunai Steve from Cities and Martin Mendel, who will be presenting with me. So I hand over the the uh, the, the parole to Marty. Thank you, thank you, Nancy. Uh, we usually say hand over the mic, but now we hand over the virtual presentation. Um, just to say that. Uh, Yes, I'm very pleased to, to be here as well. And the PowerPoint presentation that we're going to run through is very synthetic. And we invite you to have a look at the paper itself, which is a much more complete and detailed. And it's on the UNRIST um, website as one of several uh, papers dealing with promoting social and solidarity economy uh, for a uh, few public policies for local governments for various cities. Uh, I'm in Quebec. I'm not in Montreal. I'm in rural Quebec, uh, where I have been since um, <laughs> exiled, I guess, since March 2020, and very eager uh, to be back, back in Montreal and sitting beside Nancy rather than looking uh, at her screen. So um, if you could please give us the first slide. 
in our paper, we go on quite um, at length because it's extremely important um, to detail the context in which Montreal is able or not to initiate public policy measures. Um, we are a federation, uh, the country Canada, and this federation is designed in such a way uh, or defined in such a way that Canadian cities are creatures of provincial governments and therefore they fight very limited revenue and as many other cities around the world they have increasing uh, responsibilities. Their revenue comes principally from um, taxation, municipal taxation, uh, in addition to a revenue, a steady revenue, a recurrent revenue that comes from the federal government through uh, gasoline taxes that was introduced um, a number of years ago. But uh, like many other cities around the world, there is increasing devolution of responsibility um, to the city, to municipal government in Montreal. Uh, and as a result, there are new policy measures that are emanating from the municipality. And uh, there's also a trend uh, to, increase, uh, to increase their autonomy. So that's the institutional context, which as I mentioned, we detail uh, in, our, in our paper. But what is extremely important is that the social and solidarity economy in Montreal, as elsewhere in Quebec, is rooted in social dialogue with government, be it the municipal government or the provincial or the federal. Uh, it, is, it is rooted in, in the practice of co-construction and in collaborative processes. And this has been absolutely key in the development um, of the social solidarity economy uh, in uh, Montreal. And whatever policy initiatives we describe in the paper, and there are numerous, there are many, all of these have been in response to collective action in communities, in neighborhoods, um, and on in general on the first. Next slide, please. So, uh, oh, no, back one, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so, a very distinguishing feature of the social solidarity economy in Quebec and in Montreal is that it follows an ecosystemic approach. And we have established over the years uh, financial tools, uh, mechanisms of technical support, accompaniment, uh, business development, research, training, knowledge transfer, citizen mobilization, and commercialization through uh, various measures, uh, among others, of, of procurement, as we will describe uh, somewhat later. So in the literature, we speak of um, place-based, comprehensive, and integrated approaches to local development. This is certainly um, an important case study in that regard. And it also demonstrates that the social and solidarity economy, which is made up of nonprofit um, enterprises and organizations and cooperatives is really much larger than the aggregate of its uh, collective enterprises. So in other words, uh, the whole uh, is greater than the sum of, uh, of its parts. Um, much of the policy development that we describe has been initiated by stakeholders and reflects the needs, the hopes, the aspirations that are defined within or identified within communities. Um, and the processes of designing the uh, various measures are embedded in, the, in, in co-construction within government and with all levels of government. And so we see horizontality across different levels of government within different min uh, ministries or departments. And we also see, um, to the extent possible, vertical integration or vertical coordination between municipal, provincial, and federal governments. And for the time being, the federal is rather limited, but there are advances in that regard as well. Next slide, please. Uh, we, into, we introduce or include um, this diagram, which might be familiar to some in this audience, because it has uh, appeared in, in uh, other publications. But I, I think it's really important, particularly in the context of an international conference, such as MS and also GSEF, which is occurring uh, at the same time. And as you can see on the right-hand side, um, the different levels of government from local to regional to national to supranational, in the case of the European Union, for example, um, has, uh, uh, has to be coordinated. In other words, they can't be in conflict. There has to be an alignment um, between these different levels of government. 
And then on the left hand side are the various intermediaries that exist that, <clears throat> that are in relationship with the different levels of government. If you go up to the top and see the international network, social economy, actors and stakeholders, and on the right or in the middle, supranational clustered institutions, this is particularly re relevant in this context. Namely, we see the, the, the capacity for the social and solidarity economy to grow, to scale, uh, to be replicated or adapted in different environments in the North and in the South is really a reflection of the international network that has been developed uh, principally in the last uh, few years by the Global Social Economy Forum and a number of other um, networks that are present uh, in these five days of, of meetings uh, organized by GSEC and MS. Next one, please. And here I'll be very brief because, um, as I mentioned earlier, that the policy measures um, in the city, the, the autonomy of the, of the city of Montreal is still rather restricted, but we refer to what are derivative policy measures that the city benefits um, by, uh, by being able to enable the social economy, the social and solidarity economy at a local, at a municipal level. And we've listed um, some you know, keystone, milestone um, events, and they are listed here, and, we've only introduced one particular one uh, new legal structure social utility trusts because it was a very important moment in 1994 when the whole concept of a trust went beyond an um, individual trust a family trust to a, a a structure a legal structure that could create a struct a, a trust for community benefit for social benefit so the most familiar to people would be for example community land trusts and they are very pervasive then I will only underscore 2013, uh, which was really a milestone uh, in Quebec, and that was uh, the year, the fall of 2019, and the uh, signing um, or the adoption of a framework legislation in the National Assembly uh, in Quebec. This is really a very, very important event that has shaped the social and solidarity economy in Montreal and across Quebec. The other I'll underscore is 2019, the National Statistical Portrait of the Social Economy of Quebec by the Quebec Statistical Agency, because until then we did not have, we had anecdotal uh, information. So that's an extremely uh, important um, event. And now we are uh, in the midst of, we're just beginning a government action plan, which will take us to 2025. Um, and just finally, before turning over to Nancy, just that all this history, and we can go back, um, all this history that we present in this paper um, reflects also the, the resilience and the, the groundedness of the social and solidarity economy in Montreal and in Quebec, because governments have changed, new different political parties have been in power, and the social and solidarity economy has continued to grow. Okay, Nancy. Next on. slide, please, because right, we have little time to talk to you about Montreal. Um, so I guess we will not have time to go into detail about all the different policies that the city of Montreal has adopted in collaboration with social economy actors. But I think as, as Margie mentioned, you know, it has been over the years, given we've had three or four different administrations, um, and, or three different administrations, and so each of them has had a different approach. But the first major event was in 2009, and what was interesting about that was that it was not um, a policy for social economy that it was adopted by the, the city, but rather a partnership that was between actors of the social economy and the city of Montreal that recognized how the social economy helped the city to carry out its, its mandates for the population, be it in sports and recreation, be it in housing, be it in culture, and so on. And, they, and therefore, there was a mutual um, help and that the city in return um, could in many ways help and support the development of the social economy. One of the ways it did that was to set up a social economy office, which is a very small unit, but within the economic development department. Um, in 2013, the issue of procurement became a much more important issue. And so there was the beginning of the coming together and trying to figure out how uh, procurement could be used to favor social economy enterprises in Montreal. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2016, uh, there was a renewal of, uh, in, in, in Quebec, it is the um, 
city, the city governments have the mandate to support the development of SMEs. And so in that context, there had been previous structures at this time, in the new reorganization, there were funds that were, were given to support uh, um, subsidies to, for starting up uh, new initiatives by social economy enterprises. The other thing that happened was provincially, uh, Quebec government had uh, supported through a program actually the development of cooperative and nonprofit housing, which is a very important part of the way we respond to housing needs. Uh, and in 2016, the city took it over, and that has allowed the city to accelerate support for, for the social economy and the housing sector. Another issue that has been a very important issue in Montreal has been the question of food security and, and food, food autonomy to be able to, and, and obviously the COVID really brought that up, but already before COVID, um, there were several major initiatives that were are being supported by the city of Montreal being getting it food to, to schools, be it uh, reducing waste, being dealing with um, with places where people don't have access to healthy food. So, and that has been done mainly through social economy organizations and networks. Next. Um, the, the, the social economy has been integrated into the action plan for social innovation. It has been um, integrated, as I, as I mentioned, in the housing sector, and also in general, community infrastructure, helping community organizations to have be able to buy buildings and to uh, continue to offer services to community while controlling the, the cost of, 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 of lodging their, their offices. And as in the provincial level, there are many, many sectoral initiatives in culture, sports and recreation, new technologies, microtransport. So we even uh, even to counter Uber, for example, we have a, a co-op that has been offering the same kind of services, but where it's the, 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 the drivers and the owners of the, of the enterprise. So, uh, so if we go on to the last page, I have a few minutes just to talk about, can we go to the next slide? Um, oh, oh yeah, and there's other initiatives, sorry, there's been so many more recently around procurement. There were new criteria that were integrated in very recently in September 2021 that add environmental criteria, local purchasing as an economic, economic criterion and social criterion. So obviously they're not oriented exclusively for social economy enterprises, but in these contexts, these are very favorable conditions for social economy enterprises to be able to do business with the city administration. Next. Um, again, I don't have time to go through everything, but just to show, gives you some of the information on the, on the, on the housing situation. Also a very interesting project that is worth looking up is out of the student movement, there was a, a major student uprising about 10 years ago. And out of that came um, an organization that is actually developing cooperative student housing with uh, social finance and developing to be able to first of all allow uh, students because Montreal is a city of universities to have decent housing but also to take pressure off the fact that a lot of students use family houses you know and apartments that would be available for families and so it helps in, in both students and families in housing and this is another innovative initiative that's taken up by uh, graduates from you know business schools and so on but have understood that social economy is the way to the future next um, again, I don't have time to, but just to show that there's more money that has been integrated into supporting enterprises and supporting accompanying enterprises in new initiatives, for example, community bonds that have, 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 have were developed at initiative by civil society and the city of Montreal has decided to encourage this kind of a, a way of financing enterprises through local investment and through community bonds and has therefore put a little bit of money to stimulate that in the same way by supporting very important enterprises that are supporting the developing the social economy in the city. Next and final. So 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 all this to say that the, there are many lessons learned and unfortunately I'm going to do this very quickly. Um, but as Margie mentioned, the importance of an integrated ecosystem approach is a fundamental part of the success factors within uh, the, the development of the social economy in, in the city of Montreal. And this ecosystem necessarily has been Built based on partnerships and co-construction, you know, that started right from the beginning with developing a partnership as opposed to policy, and has worked its way through all the different aspects of, of, of the political agenda and the development agenda. Um, it has also been a mobilizing factor. We've been able to mobilize particularly young people and many people from across social movements because 
social economy is seen really as part of an overall vision of ecological and social transition in an urban set setting. And in that sense, it's rooted in citizen mobilization and alliances with social movement. And that is really its strength. And finally, as I mentioned, and this is so important, this is why it's so important, the research community and its involvement has helped bring this, these ideas, these practices, these lessons into universities, into the schools, and has helped us attract youth to the social economy, to the social economy once again, and the desire of youth to improve the, the world that they live in. And so all this has been a very important component of the way the social economy is moving forward and has moved forward in Montreal. So that is a very, very brief wrap up of, uh, uh, of, 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 of several decades of experience. Uh, and we encourage you to read the paper and, and dig in more if you want some more information. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margie and uh, Nancy. Margie and Nancy are the leaders of promotion of SSE in Montreal and Quebec area. And at the beginning of this session, um, I mentioned that we are supposed to uh, wrap up this session around uh, 12.50. So we have around five minutes. I can see so many questions in the chat box. So if you uh, think you have really uh, urgent and burning questions and comments, maybe you can raise your hand by pressing the symbol of hand at the bottom. So could you turn on your Mac, uh, camera, uh, all of you? We have around nine persons in the room. And uh, if you have any questions, I can see many questions from Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Yeah, we cannot hear you though. Let's try with <laughs> Sorry for this. Um, we are in the room in Terrell and we had a, a feedback between the microphone and the individual computer. Um, I come from Germany, from Frankfurt, and my question to um, the two presenters that are present would be, uh, about replacement of local government responsibilities through the social and solidarity economy. What I hear from you, to me, uh, coming from a very strong welfare state, um, implicates that uh, local governments are getting rid of their responsibilities by formulating policies to promote uh, SSEs. And in Germany, there's a very, very big skepticism of this, not only on the part of local governments, but also on the part of those who have been providing school services, social services, environmental services up to now. Um, so perhaps you could give us an impression as to your idea on this one. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Social policy and social and solidarity economy can they reconcile with each other or they are competing with each other. Alan? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of feedback. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So yes, but you know, it's not a one-to-one -one kind of relationship. Um, uh, it was the Labour Administration that really encouraged the social economy organisations to pick up uh, public services. You know, they they aggressively pursued uh, privatisation in the post Thatcher era under Tony Blair, and, uh, and they kind of uh, developed uh, an infrastructure to enable uh, social enterprises to pick up um, often in areas of health. Yeah, you know, and. Uh, Two things happened, you know, and the one, um, you know, we saw the professionalization and growth of some big charities. But the other thing that happened that was interesting was that uh, 
ultimately these smaller social enterprises their work was simply taken up by uh, large for-profit corporates for example virgin in getting involved in uh, the provision of uh, services in, in the national health service so you know ultimately uh, it hasn't really worked uh, for uh, uh, you know the public uh, and what we find now uh, that uh, the kind of budgets for many social enterprises uh, involved in things like social care is so constrained as it comes from central government to local government to social enterprise it's so constrained that they often struggle to pay the living wage, they can manage the national minimum wage, and we've got a, a, a really low paid uh, service care sector. The other thing, very quickly, Tom, is that, of course, the trade unions hate this. And it puts the social economy at odds with the trade unions. So where we've got kind of natural solidarity that can, can be encouraged, community and trade unions, we find that there are, there are odds. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, kind of persuasion to kind of bring them together. Thank you very much. Sanyeon, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, uh, in South Korea, we do have a big debate about it uh, between Ministry of uh, Health and the Welfare and the social kind of solidarity enterprise sector. Uh, because in you know, a Ministry of uh, uh, Welfare uh, want to occupy whole things by themselves. So that means there are some kind of, I think, agency issues as well. Uh, that means the government officers want to provide or everything by themselves. So they really hesitate to cooperate with uh, SSEs. Uh, in addition, more importantly, I think the officers or the ministry are, uh, that, that doesn't understand too much about the concept of a social economy because they think, uh, I mean, the social enterprises are too much commercial in terms of their point of view, I think, because it's a kind of run by commercial logic in some way, right? So I think that's one of the reasons why local, if uh, uh, central government, especially the, the, the Ministry of Welfare, really uh, do not want to understand this sector. That's my observation. Thank you. Thank you very much. As I mentioned at the beginning of this session, uh, the GCEP session, three hour long session about public policies in seven cities and guidelines will take place at one o'clock in Central European time in Mexico City. So Scotty in enterprise ship will beam us up very soon to Mexico City. And if you are interested in this debate on public policies, you are very welcome to join us in GCEP public policy session. And I share the registration link here in the chat box and you can register and check the program and you can join us and you can meet all those guys like even Margie and Nancy over there because we have all those seven case study authors and the lead author of guidelines and commentators. Thank you very much for participating in this session and I look forward to see you to see you uh, in other opportunities and other sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. See you Good soon. Day.